What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Critical Overload here. So we're going to be talking about Scream 6 in this video here again today. Going over a theory regarding Sidney Prescott and how Sidney Prescott could have been written into the story for Scream 6 that doesn't include her showing up as a savior type like she did in Scream 5. I'm also going to try to respect Guy and James' story as much as I possibly can. I don't want to drift too far apart from what they intended. And I will still keep some aspects of this a little bit convoluted. You might think it's convoluted down in the comment section. I'm, again, just trying to respect their story. But put Sidney Prescott into the mix of this in some type of monumental way that gives her purpose and isn't just her along for the ride for the sake of being here because she's Sidney Prescott, as many people want to have her reduced to, which I don't think you should ever do that. Find something for her to work with and go from there. Now, we know that Richie's family in Scream 6 was determined to get revenge on Sam for killing their brother or son, depending on who you're talking about from that crazy family. However, I've seen a lot of comments about Bailey's remarks in the finale of Scream 6 that explicitly acknowledge an opportunity for Sidney to be a target in this film, since he said something along the lines of everyone who had anything to do with his son's death dies. So this idea is basically, again, keeping mostly everything the same with Scream 6, but tossing in Sidney Prescott very early on and keeping her around till the finale. Just as much as Sam and Tara are on screen together, you're going to get a lot more of Sydney in this film. So Sydney would have been present with our core four as like an honorary fifth member for the sake of this story. Uh, so I'm imagining a sixth film that begins the same way. Jason kills Laura, goes home to Greg, finds him in the fridge, and Ghostface kills him. But instead of leaving behind Sam's driver's license, we also have Sydney's license left at the scene of the crime as well. And then instead of jumping to Sam at, after the title card and the establishing shots of New York City, instead of jumping straight to Sam and her therapist, we jump to Sydney, or a car at least, arriving at Gail Weather's apartment and inside of the car it's revealed to be Sydney Prescott. Now, Sydney is arriving to pick Gail up for a night out. It's revealed that she's in New York for vacation to visit Gail and she wanted to just catch up with her because they've gotten even closer since Dewey has died. Sydney's in the car waiting for Gail to come out. Gail eventually gets in and Sydney becomes slowly annoyed that she's taking so long some humorous lines are shared between the two before she eventually ends up driving off so they can make their dinner reservation when the car pulls off we see a shot of a blade and a robe to indicate that ghostface was watching these two ladies just a way to establish some tension and dread after the humor in the car between sydney and gail then we jump to sam at her therapist and the movie plays as normal until sam gets that call from bailey saying we need you to come down to the station and during the shots with Bailey, instead of him just having Sam's license in hand, he has Sid's license in hand as well. The bodega chase scene happens just as it does in the movie, and Sam makes it to the interrogation scene, but Sydney is in this room as well, much to Sam and Tara's shock. Sydney explains that the police managed to locate her at dinner with Gail Weathers and asked her to come in for questioning due to the fact that they found her license at the scene of the crime, which she, of course, is pissed about because, again, Miss Prescott wants peace in her life and does not want Ghostface to keep defining her entire existence. Sam, Tara, and Sydney running to Kirby at the station just like the movie we got and are told that they cannot leave the city since they are all on the suspect list, list currently so something very reminiscent of Scream 4 for Sydney Prescott's basically forcefulness of having to stay in town Sydney is also aware of the friction that exists between Gail and the carpenter so she serves as kind of a mediator of sorts between the two like Dewey did for her and Gail Sydney's arc here would basically have been helping Sam deal with her newfound fame as the daughter of Billy Loomis since that's recently been exposed to the public while also continuing to come to terms with her own unwanted fame thanks to the Woodsboro murders and the other ghost face attacks that always seem to find their way back into her life no matter how far she tries to run from it. Sydney even has a scene with Sam where she mentions people even still come up to her asking for an autograph. Hell, Let's go even further and and I'll start breaking apart my hopes for Scream 7 into the events of what could have been Scream 6 for a second. Richie's family can purposely try to cause conflict between Sam and Sydney because keep in mind, Quinn was the one who started the rumors about Sam online, but she was also the one that we would learn who happened to discover that Christina Carpenter knew that Billy and Stu were going to kill Maureen Prescott and Christina did nothing to stop them. Quinn managed to learn this little bit of detail by stalking the Carpenters during their efforts to reconnect after Christina had returned home after the events of Scream 5, but we know that that fell through and she ended up cutting off Sam 
Sam and Tara. But in the midst of all that, Quinn was able to learn that Christina knew what was going on with Maureen Prescott, something that she used and shared with her family. And they're now going to use it during their strike in New York. So during the calls to Sydney between Ghostface and Sydney, Ghostface is like, are you going to are you sure you want to trust Sam? Sam, why don't you tell her what your mom did? Sam, not knowing what the hell Christina's secret is, is like, what the hell are you talking about? And Sydney slows to just lose trust in Sam, especially when Marine's name is brought up. So Sydney's like, this bitch knows something about my mom and isn't telling me. Sam swears she doesn't know what he's talking about, but Sydney still is kind of just side eyeing Sam up until the finale. And no, Sydney does not willingly at all at ever in this movie in my head walk into that shrine scene. She instead willingly stays outside while everyone else goes on their own trauma tour. She can even have a joking line saying, you guys go, I'll stay. I've seen enough stab sets in my life. This would be a clear reference to Scream 3 and my brief way of acknowledging that Sydney already had a much better scene similar to the shrine at another point in the series we know the motive against sam is that she killed richie and that the goal is to assassinate sam's character before killing her and framing someone else as having taken matters into their own hands since sam got away with the murders in scream 5 that's what was disclosed to us in scream 6 by uh ethan himself but what about Sydney? What do they have against Sydney? Sydney is a target because Richie loves Sydney. He's a really big fan. He said it himself in Screen 5. Bailey and his kids blame Sydney because in Bailey's head, he wishes Richie had a better woman to obsess over growing up. But Sydney was his favorite character from the Stab series, and Bailey unfortunately fed into his son's fed into his son's unhealthy obsessions and he admits this in the movie himself. We hear a few brief lines of him acknowledging his own guilt in this. There's even dialogue in my head where Bailey states Richie always wanted a stab sequel that lived up to your story in the original in the original Sydney. And look what his efforts got him. My boy is dead. So see, again, Bailey knows he's at fault, but it's easier to blame the person his son idolized. And it's especially easier to blame the person who killed him in Sam Carpenter. Had Richie never got involved with either of these two women in the Bailey's heads, he'd still be alive. He wouldn't have gotten that deep into his obsession with the stab franchise and Richie's father Bailey wouldn't have been overindulging his obsession with it now the person the Baileys are intending to set up as a delusional fan taking matters into their own hands would have simply just been trying to pass Sydney off as Sam's accomplice since they believe there's no way Sam did the Woodsboro murders alone she must have had an accomplice and that accomplice in their head must have been Sydney Prescott Sydney would learn during the finale that Christina knew about Marines planned murder and did nothing and the killers are lying saying that Sam knew about this too but she just didn't know how to tell you Sydney Basically, what ends up happening is they would give Sydney an opportunity to live since Richie was such a big fan of hers, after all. And ultimately, Sydney does not turn on Sam. So we could even recreate a cotton scenario. And this time, Sydney is in cotton shoes, judging or juggling if she should help the killer for her own benefit or save Sam. And ultimately, she's siding with Sam. And then the movie just again continues to play out how it did, how we know we actually got it. You guys can let me know down in the comment section below. Do you like this? Do you think that would be a great way to factor in the character of Sidney Prescott with keeping while also still keeping the story mostly the same? Let me know down in the comment section below. If you haven't recorded, make sure you subscribe, turn on post notification, and there's a video in the description. I'll have links to my social media accounts. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can message me there, of course. Let me know if there's any movies, news, or reviews I'm going to cover in the future. And with all that in mind, guys, I will see you in the next video.